Hello, welcome to Eugene First Online. I'm Kylie, one of the pastors on staff here. And with me today, I have my friend, Alyssa Lloyd. Alyssa Lloyd, you have played on the worship team. You are now um, helping with the youth department in their worship. I've heard super, those rumors. Super amazing. I love that. So thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Um, so this is gonna be a fun little chat. We've got a lot of things to cover, but first, Ironically and totally unintentionally, this is true. We wore Christmas colors today. It was completely coincidental. Or was it the Holy Spirit? Maybe it was. Good news is the question we're going to ask today to have a little fun is Are you somebody who likes to put Christmas decorations up early or no? So we are in November, a uh, couple weeks in and Thanksgiving hasn't happened, but th this year, everything's up in the air, right? It's true. It's true. So what, are, are you guys Christmas decoration people so, or? I will say that we actually have a sorted family history about okay. Christmas decorations. Okay. Um, if anybody is aware of the Rodney and Rhonda Hallmark reindeer bean okay. bag toys, mm -hmm. um, my mom and my grandpa had this thing where they would try and outdo each other all year long buying these oh my reindeer toys. And so once Christmas would happen, he used to fly down from Alaska with the reindeer. With the reindeer. And so we'd have way. like a thousand of them everywhere in the oh house. Oh my gosh. And it's it's just, there is, there's some trauma that I've been working <laughs> through in my adult we'll life. Be um, for you. In it, you know, I mean, we're seeking deliverance. So Good. I actually, in my adult life, haven't decorated <laughs> all, because I just have like these flashbacks of like being avalanche in reindeer bean yeah. bags. Um, but we, this year, already put up Christmas lights. Good. And okay. it was more just because it was 2020 yep. and we were over it. So we put up Christmas absolutely. lights. Absolutely. So I think that is a sign of healing. I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. And if you need some of that, <laughs> maybe it's time for you to put up your Christmas lights. I, I have to tell you, I normally decorate for fall. I didn't this year. Um, but my Christmas tree is ordered from Amazon and it will be arriving at my doorstep, I believe, tomorrow. And that means Christmas Ready. is coming, you guys. I'm putting it up. I have to. I have to I put mean, it up. Naturally. It's time. So I am an early Christmas decorator on years when I feel like it. And this is a year that I just I feel like it. I need this. Yeah. That sounds right. Who doesn't? Christmas is consistent. It's exciting. It's a celebration. I need it. So are you somebody who decorates for Christmas early or no? Are your decorations up? Let us know in the comments. Toss up a little Christmas tree. Show us a little star or anything. Let us know. Um, so yeah, that's our fun little question for today. So we have a lot happening. Like I said, we've got a lot to cover. And um, one of the first things I'm gonna mention is we've been talking about these turkey boxes. These giving, these turkey boxes, it's a full meal, full Thanksgiving meal that we get to bless the families at Cascade Middle School with. Um, and we've done this for years. And so it's $30. You can purchase one. It's not too late to give for one. You can uh, purchase it through the app. You can purchase it online. Um, or you can send a check and just memo it Thanksgiving boxes. And we'll get that taken care of. Also, you can be a part of delivering them. So if you're interested in that, let us know. We would love to have you help us out with that. That's gonna happen on Tuesday, November 24th. The next thing is we've got the Connect Deeper Seminar coming up. And this, uh, this is happening on November 22nd at 3 p.m. It'll be available online and in person. For those of you who want to socially distance and stay home, we get that and we want to make this available for you too. So you've come to a seminar before, the Connect Deeper seminar, which involves membership and church history and all sorts of things, but it's fun. It's like a fun time yeah. to like get to know who we are, what we believe and why we believe it. Yeah. So, um, and there's a really cool booklet. We have that. Yeah, we have that. I'm sure it's one you read to I mean, I'm going to be honest that Matthew wrote notes in the margins and we have it. Yeah, Those see? of you who know Matthew. Yeah, it's great. So 
you want to sign up just for this booklet you're gonna get. Your child Trust comes, me. do provide a helmet. Oh yeah, don't wanna fall off the steps. I believe that happened, but she's good. She's happy, she's good. I mean, good. we won't know for a while if there's lasting <laughs> damage. It's fun though, you guys. It, we wanna invite you to that. So you can sign up in the link above or below or beside on whatever format you're watching. Next thing, we have the app. Yay! And it is available for Android Dying. users and Apple users True. and super user friendly. Easy to download? Yes. And clean looking? Yes. There's a live feed. There are push notifications, which won't send, like notifications to you every day. But if an event changes, like if say we have torrential downpour and we are meeting out on the property, you will get a notification that says service canceled, <laughs> see you online, instead of showing up and it not happening. So that's cool. So sign up for the app, download it by texting Eugene First App to 77977 on whatever product you're using and you can walk through the process on that. The next thing we have is the major project. There's so much. So this major project, Alyssa, I wanna tell you about it because it is super cool. Pastor Jamie is putting this on. What I've heard is this is something to invite your friends to, to build a manger at our new winter community event. So you guys can come and sign up for there's like specified time so it's safe and distanced and clean and you have your your stuff and you get to build this super cool manger like as a as a family which is super fun and then you get to have it and it's like the gift that keeps on giving for years to come so that's what that is we'll be there i'm inviting my friend yay so if you would like to be there I'm inviting you. Now, what kind of manger are we talking about here? Like, can I put my child in this manger? Um, your child can put her baby doll oh, in this manger. Oh, she is down for that. Yeah. She is on that train. Yeah, so it's very cool. And next week, I will have one with me to Ooh. show you guys. So that's happening. And let's see. We've got work parties. Okay. So, Alyssa, you've been around here long enough. You've seen the stains. Yes. Those stains have stories, but it's sometimes okay to cover these up, right? Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. In this case, we have a core value of uh, uh, radical generosity, river stepping faith, and relentless hospitality. And we really believe that these renovations that are taking place are going to make our home, our church home, more hospitable to the people we welcome in. So we have work parties happening as we change floors and we paint walls and um, switch light fixtures and all those fun things. And you're invited. I know it may sound like, oh, great. Yay. It's actually really fun. And I want to tell you, I walked in the other day and I saw, you know, I saw people with their masks on, but I was like, these are my people. This is my family. And it was super exciting yeah. to see some people. So. 1 p.m. It's happening on Sundays. Today, you can come by at 1 p.m. or you can sign up. There's a spot to work with a mask and a space and you're gonna be good to go. And I will say, the building is transformed. It yeah. looks so different. I actually couldn't find the bathroom earlier. <laughs> that is a true story. We and haven't Olivia, moved it, but... Olivia had to help me a little bit, so. <laughs> it Maybe that new signs building. are going up on the doors, you know, but. You won't know unless you come. The changes are good, right? Yeah. Like they're it slow looks progression, so bright. but it's happening. Yes, it's bright and it's it feels more inviting yeah. already. And it feels like, oh, I actually would place my child on this floor yes. and not like spray them with bleach after. <laughs> I mean, because nobody wants to do that. I mean, you might not consider, but you don't really want to. So it can yeah, be questionable. It, it has a, a very different feeling. Now. Yeah, for sure. So you guys, this is happening. It's exciting to be a part of. And um, yeah, so come join us 1 p.m. today, next Sunday as well. And uh, you can sign up also uh, through the link. The last thing is this, I'm gonna switch gears. Um, we are in a new sermon series uh, where Pastor Ryan is walking through, got my hands, got my hands because we're in a new sermon series. I just don't know what to do with mine. I, it's all right, it's all, we can high five. There we go, we're, see, we're having a good time, right? Oh. Um, Pastor Ryan's walking through 1 Timothy and talking about, I love the church, or I love the church, I love Jesus, but hate the church, yeah. right? 
And so we're looking at different reasons people tend to have disdain towards the church. And this week we're talking about finances. Uh, finances, depends on how you say that. There's important it's emphasis. Elegant. I wish I spoke more elegantly, but you know, I'm working on it. So today, uh, the question he's asking um, has to do with Paul giving some very pointed instructions to the church. And he's, uh, he's talking about their finances and their resources and, and just stewarding well. And so the question Pastor Ryan wants us to consider today is, does your money spending speak to the, uh, what messages does your money spending speak to the world around you? Mm. So um, I, I guess I'll give an example. I've been feeling increasingly convicted about um, just different financial resources that I have. And I just today, well, just this last week actually, downgraded my car, countercultural. Um, now I don't need like a pat on the back or anything, but I've been feeling like God just saying, what is, what is your money spending habit speak? What message does it give to the people around you? So that's like real world for me. And um, we live in a culture that just, wants to consume, right? And and wants more and that's always coming at us and what's the next thing? Next iPhone's out, next this is out. Um, but what is your money spending habits? What message do they give to the people around you? Yeah, I think too that's so crystallized at this point in time because of the year we've had. Yeah. It's not it's not something that you can kind of leave on the back burner because right. the money that you're operating with, I mean, these are big stakes. Yeah. Where you put your money right now has a huge say. We think of the businesses that are suffering, right. the people whose incomes are different. Like yes. what you do with your money is at this point a bigger message maybe than yep. we've ever had in our lives. Yeah, it's I absolutely agree with that. And I think that there there is a lot at stake right now. And so how are we as kingdom people, yes. as Jesus followers, how are we responding to the activity of God in our own personal lives? How are we as a greater church? And I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today too. And just how are we as a as a Christian community? How are we as a people of God responding to that? So yeah. one thing I think too from somebody who's not on staff at the church, when we first started coming, this is a church that you can review financials yep. on. You can see where yep. every dollar goes. And that is just not typical. It is not normal. And it yep. is so cool to be able to say, I totally hear that criticism of the church. Do you want to know where the yeah. money goes here? Right. And that's probably information that would be accessible in the Absolutely. app. Absolutely. Well, I don't know about do the our app, financial but you can let review. Us know. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, I think that's a Product great pulse, that's a great idea if you're listening. Um, yeah, but you know, just yeah. <laughs> the way that the the church here specifically has that financial accountability yeah. piece. So that, you know, as we're, we're thinking like, what does this mean? Where does this go to? We actually are a church that has a literal answer to that. Yeah, and it, we are totally an open book um, because we believe that we need to steward well the resources God has given us as a church. And, um, and then, then bringing it back into you and to me, if I were to give you a printout of my bank statement, does my money spending, does it tell you a message about me being a follower of Jesus. And I think that's that's deeply convicting, yeah. I just have to say. I mean, I am a very much a follower of the coffee industry. I, um, I will. I keep them in business. I will put that one out. Yeah, so Sip, if you're watching. Um, yes. You've got me hooked on them, by the way. Yeah, all right. I'm feeling the conviction right now, but I think it's gonna be a good we message. We can talk about it over coffee. I think we should, I'll budget it. All right. Okay, you guys, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Alyssa, for being on this chat with me. It's going to be a great message today, you guys. I can't wait to see how we get a little bit of clarity on stewarding well our resources. So God bless you guys. We'll see you later. Hi, welcome to Eugene First Online. We're the Rarics. This is Nate. I'm Emily. We made Eugene First our church home several years ago and we are so excited to be able to gather online and worship with you this morning. Wherever you're at this morning, the Spirit of the Lord is there with you as you worship. Um, He's welcoming you into His presence. Let's worship.
You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old void inside. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. But there's a better life. There's a better life. You got pain. If you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Sing that with me. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it. Testify, testify, oh, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, if you got pain, he's a pain taker, if you feel Shaking Savior, if you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking Savior, if you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Yeah. 
and were the skies of parchment made were every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God from sky to sky. For oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and Hey friends, welcome to Eugene First. Let's pray and thank God for that time of worship we just had. Heavenly Father, we love you and uh, we are so grateful for your presence that is with us wherever we are at, your presence is there. And God, that's the very thing we need. We need you. We need your presence. It's not optional, but God, we, we have to have you. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. It's in you that we, that we find our true identity and we discover, God, our true destiny. And so, Lord, I just pray for our time together. Uh, God, I ask that your word would uh, be rich, Lord, that it would inspire, that it would mold and shape, that, God, it would call out to the deepest part of us, and that, Lord, it would form in us the character of Jesus in such a real and relevant, profound way. And so, Lord, we present ourselves to a throne of grace and to a good, good God. And we just ask, Lord, for you to do what only you can do. Be God to us, in us, and through us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, friends, welcome to Eugene First. We are, uh, we're, we're gathered in a lot of different locations right now in this season. Uh, some of us uh, have been gathering out on a field in the West 11th. Some of us are gathering underneath a bridge. Some of us are in homes. Some of us are listening to this on podcasts later uh, in other states, in other places. Uh, I just want to say wherever you are joining us uh, today or whenever you're listening to this, God bless you. And uh, I pray that our time together uh, adds so much value to your life, encourages you uh, to be a more faithful follower of Jesus, and just to simply respond yes to the indwelling presence of Jesus in you. And if you don't have that, the indwelling presence of Jesus, all it is is a simple yes to Jesus, to say, I want to follow you. I want to go in the way of Jesus. And when you turn and say, yes, Lord, I need you, he will fill you with the very presence of Jesus himself. God will fill you with the spirit of Jesus. And so, hey, uh, that's, that's my hope and prayer that as we journey together, uh, that our time truly would add value to your life. Hey, we have been in a series called I Love Jesus But Hate the Church. And in that series, uh, this is our third week. We have one more after this. We've been tackling and hitting some topics that are uh, quite controversial and that have caused people a lot of uh, problem issue when it comes to uh, trusting the church. Um, we, he we hear a lot, you know, um, I, I love Jesus. I'm spiritual. I just don't 
I just don't buy into the whole church thing. I mean, you can't trust them. You, organized religion. I, I hate religion. And <laughs> part of me is like, hey, me too, man. I hate religion. Anything created to control people, I, you know, for for other people's selfish benefit, uh, no bueno, not good. Um, but you may or may not know this. The church isn't that. The church, oh, the church is the called out ones, those that have been called out of sin and darkness and brokenness and who have received the hope, the healing and the wholeness that Jesus brings. Those that have been called out of brokenness into wholeness, out of darkness into light. Those that have the spirit of Jesus alive in them, called out of their past into God's desired future for them, into the plans and dreams that God has for their lives, the very good works that God has planned for them from the beginning of time, the called out ones, a community of love, a community of people that are bearing witness to the way of Jesus in our day. That's the church. And so Hey, we are, uh, we're in our third week, like I said. Uh, we, we've looked at uh, uh, two topics previous to this. We've, we've looked at the role of leaders in authority. Uh, we've, we're, this week, we're going to be looking at finances. And then next week, we're looking at... Um, uh, <laughs> I just had a little brain fart. Uh, uh, oh, the role of Scripture. That's what it is. Uh, the role of Scripture. And so, uh, man, some, some wonderful times. Last week, just like a quick recap from last week, Paul was dealing with the crisis in the church in Ephesus. And we just came to this conclusion that it was a crisis of leadership. And, and I think in Paul's understanding, um, he understood, right, that leaders in the church play a significant role in how the church operates and functions and, and what it looks like and what it does. And, and you might say that everything rises and falls on the quality and conduct of leadership in the church. And we walked away from those 13 verses that, that Paul was uh, talking about regarding church leadership and we just kind of made this conclusion that, that Paul was letting Timothy in on a little, little secret. And he was saying to Timothy, Timothy, you've got way too many emotionally immature, self-unaware people with underdeveloped characters who are occupying roles of leadership in the church in Ephesus. And you've got to stop that. Why? Because often, most oftentimes what happens is when emotionally immature, self-unaware people with underdeveloped characters occupy roles of leadership in the church. When that happens, most oftentimes they misuse and abuse their authority, using it for themselves and their own ego rather than leveraging it to lift others up. And consequently, people are hurt in the process. Leaders have got to understand that the church is not a commodity to be used, but a community to be served. And, and, and so Paul is calling on Timothy, and I think therefore us, Paul's calling on us to ensure that our leaders in the church are giving themselves yes to Jesus, no doubt about that, to be with, become like, and do what Jesus did, but giving themselves specifically to emotional maturity, self-awareness, and having their character and their conduct developed by the very person of Jesus himself. And I say that is a much needed lesson then, and it's a much needed lesson now. And if you believe that, somebody shout amen. Give me some love. Type it in the comments. Do something. Um, too many leaders, too many leaders and pastors in the church are, are the emotional age of two, yet they're running around in adult bodies. And Paul says, no, <laughs> come back. Come back, return to the non-negotiables of church leadership, emotional maturity, self-awareness, and a developing character of Christ-likeness. Let Jesus develop you. And so this week, though, so last week was authority in church leadership. This week, we are looking at the role of finances, a hot, hot topic in the church um, fertile ground for mistrust. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust in the church as it relates to finances and how the church handles money. Um, <laughs> 
there, there, there's been seasons. Uh, I mean, the 70s, the 80s, uh, probably some of the 90s, uh, the televangelists, the, the prosperity-driven mega church stuff, you know, it, it, those movements didn't do any uh, good to contribute to rebuilding trust in people's perspective of the church to handle finances. And uh, you don't even have to look to the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Uh, just last year, 2019, there was a Christian leader of an organization who was caught stealing money. And, and so it's, it's like right here in our front door. And so we've, we've got to just kind of ask ourselves the question, uh, what does Paul say about it? What do the scriptures say about it? How, how ought the church handle finances and, and, and how can we do it in a way that glorifies God and serves humanity? And, and how can we do it with, with a, a deep sense of integrity, transparency, in a way that, again, glorifies God and honors people? So today, what we're going to do Here's a little roadmap over time. We're going to uh, stop in 1 Timothy and look at what Paul has to say on this topic. Again, there's several places that Paul mentions money in 1 Timothy, so we'll take a, a quick view of that. Then we're going to go to an interview that I, uh, that I had with our church treasurer, Ron Alexander, so that you can better understand how our faith family handles finances. Um, and then we're going to make some personal applications uh, as to, you know, so what? Like, <laughs> that's good. What does that mean for me? Um, I'm just an average Joe, average Jill, trying to say yes to Jesus and, and, and be a faithful follower of Christ and, and live the way of Jesus. You know what? So what? What does it mean to me? So that's our three movements today. Uh, First Timothy, an interview with our church treasurer, Ron Alexander, to, to explore and look at how this faith family handles finances, and then some personal applications. So what I want to do is uh, start by reading 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 12. Then we'll kind of step back and look at all the places that Paul uh, talks about money in 1 Timothy, and uh, then we'll go to the interview. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 12. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicion. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they've turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Keep in mind, Paul's talking about leaders in the church here. Verse 6, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Verse 9, But people who long to be rich fall into, temp fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness in a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for this scripture and for the other scriptures we're about to read. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' mighty name that you, that th these scriptures, even on the topic of finances, Lord, that it would bring comfort to those who need comfort that it would bring guidance to those who need guidance, that, God, it would bring direction to those who need direction and correction to those who need correction. Lord, speak to your people. 
through the text in a language that they can understand. And Lord, may it edify, build up, breathe life into your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so there are a total of 13 verses in 1 Timothy that deal specifically with money leaders in the church, um, specifically with, with money in the church. Um, just a point of awareness, that is 11 and a half percent of the letter is dedicated to bringing clarity and instruction on how church leaders and wealthy people should relate to money in the church. Okay, 11 and a half percent of First Timothy is given to bringing clarity and instruction on how church leaders and wealthy people in the church should relate to money. And I would broaden that and just say to all people. Uh, apparently, mishandling and misusing money uh, is not simply a 21st century problem. Uh, we see it going on in uh, 1 Timothy, which was a first century kind of a problem. And you might just say it's a human heart problem. Uh, and so this whole dynamic and struggle between uh, how people uh, relate and handle money Again, you know as well as I do, it's not even just a church thing. It's just a human heart thing because this is all over the board. In every area and sphere and influence of life, there is misuse and abuse of money. But specifically, we want to zero in on the church because of all people, come on, of all people, the church ought to handle money with the utmost respect, integrity, and transparency in a way that is becoming of followers of Jesus. So before we jump into this conversation uh, interview with Ron Alexander, I want to just give an overview of how Paul addresses money in 1 Timothy. There are five places or 13 verses or 11.5% of the letter dealing with this topic. Three of the times Paul is talking about how leaders in the church should relate to money. One time he's talking about how the church should appropriately compensate church leaders. And then another time he's talking about how wealthy people in the church should relate to their own money. So check this out. 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. And again, this is in the context of church leaders. So church leaders are not to love money. Uh, just in case you weren't sure about that, skip down to verse 8 of chapter 3. In the same way, deacons, again church leaders, must be well respected and have integrity. They, may, they must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. So church leaders are not to love money or to be dishonest with money. We read 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 3 through 12, which deals with a very similar concept. But check out. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, dealing with how the church ought to compensate leaders. Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. Verse 18, for the scripture says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. So that's four times that Paul's used or referenced money and church leaders in the church. Uh, the fifth time comes out of chapter 6, verse 17 and 19 through 19. It says this, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not trust their money which is so unreliable. <laughs> I love that. Don't trust your money. Don't be proud about it. Why? It's unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Verse 18, tell them, wealthy people, rich people in the church of this world, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so they may experience life. Here's the conclusion. Church leaders are not to love money. 
be dishonest with money, or use godliness as a means to become rich. Yet at the same time, the church is to pay well those who lead well, and wealthy church members are not to be proud and to trust their money, but they're to use their money in order to do good for other people. So five times Paul references money and the church. 11.5% of this letter is given to instructing the church on how to deal with money. So with that in mind, and with the reality that uh, churches do not have a good reputation with handling finances in our, in our culture, so w- with those two things in mind, I want to go to our, my conversation with Ron Alexander, again, our church treasurer, and here we're going to explore uh, how our faith family handles money uh, with integrity and what principles and how do we do that. We just want to be transparent with our faith family uh, because Paul apparently was quite transparent in giving instructions on how to handle it. So we just want to talk about it, have the conversation. Um, we want our people to know and our greater culture to know that we handle finances with the utmost respect, integrity, and with a a high level of transparency because we want people to have confidence that our church leadership is, is appropriately and rightly handling the money that's been entrusted to them from people who give generously as an act of worship and obedience to God. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Ron Alexander. Well, we are here with this conversation uh, with my good friend, Ron Alexander. Um, Ron, would you take a moment and just introduce yourself because there are several people who are watching who probably uh, do not know you, but you've been around for a little while, I believe. A little while? Uh, 1988. Nice. 1988. All right. So just take a couple moments, introduce yourself so those who may not know you um, can get a sense of, of who you are and how, you, how you've how you been around here at uh, Eugene First. Sure. So I came here right out of college. I got a job with UPS. Um, in February, I will hit 33 years. Uh, in March, I will hit 33 years of marriage mm-hmm. with my lovely wife, Valerie. Uh, we have three girls, Trisha, who's 34, uh, Sophie, who's 23, and Claire, who's 22, and probably the best son-in-law ever, Michael. We're pretty proud of him. Uh, I will say I grew up in the church. Uh, I remember uh, praying a sinner's prayer at age four uh, with my mom. Um, I have two great uncles that were Nazarene pastors. Um, Mom was in children's ministry for decades and served as a administrative assistant. So uh, my, my DNA, it's kind of the family business being in the church and, and serving. So um, that's a little bit about, about me. Cool. Um, well, as you know, we are in the series, I love Jesus, but hate the church. And we're walking through four areas that have caused some, um, some mistrust that people might have with the church, uh, hypocrisy, uh, authority, uh, this week, we're looking at finances, which is what our conversation is going to be about. And then next week, we'll be looking at the use of scripture. So um, finances, finances and money in the church, um, it's a thing. Um, and it's a thing that we want to do well. And so just a quick little context before we jump into some of the other questions. Uh, how long have you been serving as a treasurer? And what do you do as the treasurer? <laughs> Well, you've only given me two minutes for each question, so I'll try to make that work. Um, I have been serving as treasurer since uh, 2007. Um, and uh, what do I do? Uh, well, uh, my role, um, independent um, of anybody else and as part of the advisor team, is to set um, strategic goals for the church, um, mostly related around budgeting. Um, and, uh, and then monitoring the budget throughout the year and reporting to the board and to the district. Cool. Cool. So, okay, here, here's, we're, we're going to jump right into the meat. You ready? Yeah. Mishandling money, uh, in churches is, is a major cause of mistrust. 
Um, oftentimes it happens because there's a lack of checks and balances. Um, and so I, I guess what, what, what I would love to hear from you as a treasurer, uh, from the time that someone gives, like they used to give an offering plate, those days are, are gone because of the whole Rona. Um, but the time that someone gives, um, what, what, what are our money handling principles and policies that we kind of operate by? And similar and probably the same question, but what systems of checks and balances are in place to ensure that things are handled with, uh, with utmost integrity? Uh, sure. So, yeah, uh, especially with now with Corona, most of our giving is online, but we still receive quite a number of checks each week into the church office. Those checks are, are held uh, for our account team, um, who is a pair of longtime lay people. Uh, I think more than, I mean, pushing close to a decade, I think, for both of those folks. Um, they count the checks. Um, and any cash that comes in, they produce a report. All that goes to our bookkeeper, uh, Dave Dirksen, who then remotely deposits the checks. Um, and then Dave enters all that information into our accounting software, QuickBooks. Um, I receive that information then. And on a monthly basis, I report to the board uh, with my reports. And so really, um, for the income, there's, there's, there's three points of, um, uh, of sameness, I suppose, which would be the report from the counters. Uh, Dave then inputting that information into QuickBooks and then the information we receive back from the bank uh, in terms of the bank statement. All of those have to align up. And I will say that we have an audit team every year that goes through each month and they make sure that what I report to the board matches up with the counters, what they've counted for the month and their report and then and then Dave's part too. So uh, what we three uh, do, the counters, Dave and myself then is reviewed at year end by the audit team. And then they uh, produce a report for the district and for the church. Yeah, is the audit mandatory audit or is that, um... Is that something it's, that would be yeah. the good of it? We would do it anyway, um, but it's, it is something that's mandated by the district. Okay. Um, I will say that we've always had good protocols and procedures, um, even before I was treasurer. But uh, what I noticed um, when I took over in 2007 and this audit team uh, kind of came on with me, their main goal is, um, it's funny that you, you talked about transparency and everything, their main goal is to protect the church um, from any kind of accusation of mishandling money. Um, I will also say that what I didn't say in that is that staff, pastoral staff never handle money. Yeah. Um, in fact, the only person that deals with money is our bookkeeper, Dave. Other than that, it's all lay people. Yeah. And I, I believe uh, it's always done in tandem. There's pairs, right? We do everything in teams. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, I don't even write the checks. Um, that protects the church. That protects me. Um, we have Dave. He writes the checks. Um, I review them and I sign them. Um, so I don't even write checks. Um, if there's a check that needs to be signed, maybe I'm on mission, I'm gone, and you sign it. Yeah. We take a photocopy of that check and we stick it in the, uh, the file and I review that when I get back. Um, any voided checks also go in that same file so that they dovetail with the bank statement and we can see that if there are any missing checks or not. So there is a uh, reliable system in place that checks and balances things as they go and uh, along the journey up into the audit and then it gets audited again or reviewed again at that time. So, uh, that, sounds, that, that seems pretty, uh, pretty legit to me. Um, okay. Uh, what, what are some financial budgeting goals? So you talked about some of the strategic stuff um, that's part of your job as, as, as treasurer. Um, a, a couple goals that, that come to your mind, um, you know, where we're at currently. Yeah. So I think that the, probably my primary goal every year is to make sure that our people are taken care of. Yeah. Um, they are our most important resource and they are the ones that generate all the results mostly. 
Um, and so if we can fairly compensate our people and take care of them and sort of remove that financial pressure from them, the church moves and operates much more efficiently and, um, and productively. Um, in terms of, of budgeting, um, in the last couple of years, we've set a target of trying to budget at 90% of projected income. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, that's a little bit hard to do when we budgeted about 98%, 99%. Yeah. Um, we want to use God's resources efficiently, uh, but we also understand that there's an ebb and flow to church finances, and we want to be able to budget in a way that can absorb some of that. Um, there's another goal that we have, which is to set salaries at about 50%, move towards a 50% of total budget. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're at 59%, which is down from when I took over. It was about 65% or so. And I will say that I also am, um, I don't necessarily like, um, you know, what seems to be a random number. Sure. Um, I think, I think the 50%, 50, 55% is, is a good number for most churches. Um, having said that, we're not most churches. Um, we are our church. And um, again, getting back to what I said at the beginning, the first priority we have is to make sure that we take care of our people and, and then honor God with our spending. We, there's an entire budget process we go through, lots of eyeballs on it. So it's not just two or three people deciding how to spend all the money. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think the um, a combination both of the the budgeting process and the I'll just say radical generosity of the people, um, it's led us to a place where uh, we have a um, a very prudent reserve of about four months of operating expenses right now, and um, I, I think I mean that's that's a blessing for any church and uh, certainly for ours. Right. So there's a lot of discussion in church circles about how much of an operating um, reserve do you have. Uh, four months is a really good number, um, up to six months. I wouldn't want to get beyond six months because it's not the job of the church to sit back on, on resources that need to be spent for kingdom purposes. But, but four months is good. We're currently at about five right now. Um, if you get about six months, that's probably about too much of a reserve, and you need to find ways to get that money into ministry. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. Last one. Ron, okay. the church treasurer. Remind me, r r remind me and others how long you've been the church treasurer right now? Um, since 2008. So 12, 13 okay. years. So Ron Alexander, church treasurer for 12 or 13 years. Um, any, any, this is kind of like an open ended. Is there anything that you, uh, would want to to say to our faith family uh, anything that you would want to address um, in in terms of church finances and uh, yeah just any any anything from your heart to theirs I think we do a really good job I mean I'll say that up front um, I would open up our books to anybody I would sit down with anybody who had a question and I think we could easily show them what we do um, having said that. Um, I don't think that I'm extraordinary. Um, I think that I stand on the shoulders of those that came before me. Um, I think in particular of Ken Reinard, who was our 40-year treasurer uh, before me. His father was the treasurer before him. And those two guys, plus me, are the only three treasurers this church has ever had. Wow. I don't think I'm going to make 40 years. I'm just, I think Ken's <laughs> got that record. Um, so I learned... I learned church money management from, from Ken. Uh, he probably, he's so humble. He, he probably wouldn't accept that, but it's true. I learned generosity in church finances from Vern Schwinn. Um, and so I think back to what, what Pastor Les used to say, which is people do what people see. Yeah. And these leaders that came before me, I saw how they operated and I'm just trying to take what they've done and, and do it in a new generation of leadership uh, to honor we, we all, the church isn't just a church in this moment. The church is an organization and an organism that has a history. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to honor, and we all want to honor those in leadership. What came before those people that made sacrifices before us? Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the, one of the keys for this generation is uh, transparency when it comes to finances. 
uh, particularly in the church. Um, and so I really appreciate your comment there, um, a, a willingness to sit down and open the books. Uh, it, it is an open book. Um, we, we have zero to hide. And in fact, um, would want to err on the side of openness and transparency anyway, um, as we are, uh, we've been entrusted with a, a precious resource. Um, people are giving sacrificially as an act of worship to God. And then we are entrusted as leaders in the church to manage those resources in a way that uh, honors God and a way that serves people and, um, and, and transparency with, uh, with our faith family is, is, is huge. And so um, perhaps you're, you're, you're going to be listening to this and uh, you, you may want to take um, Ron up on that offer. Um, f- hey, feel free, email us at uh, office at eugenefirst.org and we can get you in touch. Um, and, uh, and, and you can just see for yourself. So uh, Ron, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, the years of service that you have uh, given to Eugene First in this role. Uh, God has graced you and anointed you for this season, and um, I am excited to continue to see how God uh, uses your gifts and graces in our faith family in the years to come. So thank you so much, and uh, thanks for this time. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Bye. Well, friends, I hope that conversation was insightful and helpful for you as it was for me. Um, It is a truism that generally applies to all of us, that uh, how we individually handle the money we've been given responsibility for is an act of worship to God. I mean, you have some measure that you've been entrusted with, and how you handle that is is an act of worship, and we've been given stewardship from God, and so we want to handle it in a way that brings God glory and lifts other people up. And and secondly, uh, we are ultimately all accountable to God on how we manage the, the money that God's given us responsibility for. And so we we simply want our finances to communicate to our world the gospel of Jesus, the love of God, and that as we handle this precious resource that people so generously give as an act of worship, we want people to know that we are doing it with utmost respect, with integrity and transparency. And so may we all learn a lesson from 1 Timothy on how we as followers of Jesus relate and handle finances. May it be said of our faith family that when people look at our finances, both as a church and as individuals, may it be said of us that when people look at our stuff that we don't talk about a lot, that they see a message of love and care and redemption by the way we handle and spend our money. So God, give us wisdom, give us direction, and may we glorify you, and may we seek to do good to those around us in the way we manage and handle the money that you've given us responsibility for. So God bless you, friends. May the Spirit of the living God be with you. May God cause His face to shine on you in you and through you, and may the God of comfort be your comfort, and may the Spirit of peace be your peace. Remember, Jesus' yoke is easy and His burden is light, and He invites anyone who will to come follow Him in the way of life. And one of the ways we follow Him in the way of life is how we handle our finances. Let's do it with integrity. Let's do it with transparency. And let's do it with a way that honors God and blesses other people. Hey, God bless you, faith family. Let's continue on the journey of simply saying yes to Jesus. God bless. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us today. Our vision at Eugene First is that every person would live in the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus. 
If this is your first time connecting with us or if you haven't filled out a Connect card yet, here's why you want to. First, we're gonna send $10 in your name to our fresh water well projects with our partner Churchers in Africa. Second, we're gonna send you a welcome gift just for joining us today. And third, we are inviting you to our Connect Party, which is a great way for us to get to know you and to give you a glimpse into what being a part of this faith family here at Eugene First is all about. Fill out the Connect card found on a link by this video. The Eugene First office team is here to help you throughout the week. We're ready to journey with you as you find freedom in Jesus. One of the primary places for that to happen is in a Connect group. Connect groups are where community happens, where friendships are developed, and where transformation into Christ-likeness can take place. Give us a call or email office at eugenefirst.org to let us know you're interested. You can also head over to our website, eugenefirst.org, which is a great place to find contact info for all of the pastors and support staff. You have a unique story, and the Faith family here at Eugene First loves unique stories. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, we offer ways to get you connected and to discover purpose. There are always things happening around here, and so I invite you to visit us at eugenefirst.org, to download our Eugene First app, to say hello to us on Facebook or Instagram, or you can just email us at office at eugenefirst.org. My name is Court, and I can't wait to hear your story. You are loved. Our goal at Eugene First Youth is to empower and equip our young people to be lifelong followers of Jesus. We believe that when you discover your purpose and what God made you for, you will be the best you that you can be. We want to journey with you, and, and we want to help you discover and develop a strong relationship with God. If you're a teenager and you're wanting to get connected, I invite you to go to our app, in there, you can find more information about when and where we meet and ways that you can get connected with us. Maybe you're already a part of Eugene First and you're ready to take a next step in this faith family. There are several serve teams you can be a part of to help you discover purpose as we serve our city together. Check out our app to discover the ways you can partner with our heart and vision of seeing every person living in the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus. Have kids? Are you a kid? You can make a difference no matter your age. Here at Eugene First, we want our kids to know God, discover their purpose, and make a difference through serving others. Contact our office for an invitation to our Eugene First Kids Facebook page where you'll find tools and support for your family as we walk this journey together. At Eugene First, we love this city. Not just the place, but the people. And our vision is to see a vibrant community where everyone lives in the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus. Our vision compels us outside our building walls to live invitationally in all the places where we work, study, and play. And you're invited. You're invited to join us in helping people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and together we'll make a difference.